Sterling, thank you for your time. The Rugby World Cup is just days away when a tournament of this nature comes around. Do you wish you were still playing in, in some ways? Oh look, the World Cup is the pinnacle of rugby, no doubt about that at all. However, uh, I'm about three years at least since retiring and uh, you know, life has changed dramatically for me since since those days. And in particular, you know, I retired due to the fact that my body just couldn't handle uh, training and playing at that level anymore. Um, the game continues to get faster and stronger and, and, and everything. The demand is, is ever increasing. Uh, I had a long career and, uh, you know, I hung up the boots with no regrets. Yeah. So for me, I'm so excited because this is the first real World Cup from, from my perspective where I've been retired, I'm not actively playing, I'm just going over there as a spectator. I'm really looking forward to enjoying to see, you know, who who goes well, who surprises, and obviously behind the Wallabies 100%. Yeah, sure. What about the build-up for the Wallabies? How have you viewed their preparation so far? Oh, look, I think notwithstanding the final game over in Auckland, and even taking that in consideration, the Wallabies' preparation into the World Cup has almost been ideal. Uh, so there's been, from my perspective, there's been an absolute improvement in set piece. Um, perhaps the line out is the one thing in set piece wise that, that has still been a little bit erratic, uh, and but also fundamentally the team that have been selected, that has put a little bit of pressure back on that set piece, on back on the line outs. But, Probably I've been more impressed with the progression of the scrum in particular. Uh, f from my perspective, watching that first Bledisloe Cup match in Sydney and seeing the first scrum, which is you know so important in, in, in that, like I never played there, but from my perspective, it always was a really important um, attribute to set the tone for the first scrum of the, of, of, of the, of the, the match. And that one, we dominated the All Blacks. We actually should have got an, uh, I would have thought, uh, a penalty from that scrum. We yep. didn't, but the rest of the day was a really strong day for the forward pack in the scrum. And to me that typifies how far the, 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 the tight forwards in particular have come in the scrum. And, you know, looking at the, the Northern Hemisphere World Cup in UK, the scrum is the number one uh, set piece you have to absolutely get right. Uh, and so, um, from that perspective, a lot of development. I also think uh, the attacking prowess of this team has always been strong. Uh, but probably more that I've been impressed with leading up to the World Cup campaign has been probably the backbone of the, the Wallabies underneath Checkers' uh, reign has been working hard and physical intent. Uh, I think back to the days when I played, and that was one of the things I really tried to focus on is the intent of the physical battle. Um, but you look at all the test matches where the guys have played under, underneath Checker, and every single performance, there's been really strong physicality at the tackle, at the breakdown. And from my perspective, that's fantastic leading to this World Cup campaign as well. The continual rotation of players during the Rugby Championship and Bledisloe Cup, does that have the potential to come back and haunt the Wallabies in regards to team stability? Yeah, it's a sort of a double-edged sword. Uh, you want to create an environment whereby players are absolutely valuing every time they put on that jersey and and because it can go it can go straight away it can have an injury your form can go straight away um, and there are, and there are, so there's the things in your control and things out of your control right but to have an environment environment whereby you put a huge amount of value and impetus on that one test match I think it's fantastic the flip side of it is when you are chopping and changing uh, one of the most critical components of getting a team performing well is having tried and true combinations that you know under test match pressure, under test match fatigue and then ramp that up at a World Cup, I can back on the guy next to me. And that comes from playing together, it comes from combinations. And that's the one thing that probably they haven't had. But I'd argue the Czechs only had the guys for less than 12 months anyway. So were they going to get that that co cohesive unit, the combination's down pat anyway? Probably not. Okay. The uh, speculation surrounding the halves combination still <laughs> continues. 
How much of a concern is that in not having a set 9 and 10 heading into the opening game? Well, it's a bit of a concern. If you have a look at every team that's won the World Cup, usually it's been on the back of the half combinations at the best, if not close to the best in the world at the time. And rugby in general, so much hinges on your 9 and 10, combining well. Uh, like, uh, obviously the platform is laid by the forwards. Uh, 9 and 10 are the, are the conduit to making sure that that platform is exposed and, and leveraged as much as possible by the back line. Uh, so that is a bit of a concern. However, again, I, I think back to the World Cup campaigns that I was involved in. In, in 2003, we probably overachieved. In 2007, we underachieved. However, 2007, we had an injury to Stephen Larkham, our number one ball player, in, I think, the first match or after the first match. It was very start of the tournament. And we had really no plan B. We had it put a massive spanner in our works as far as what we're going to do next as a team. And we identified it probably at least 12 months prior that, that we did hinge a lot on on the ball playing attributes of Stephen Larkham. And we tried to bring in other guys, but the reality was so much of our game and our plan, everything we did was revolved around this guy who was a freak, right? And you thought other guys could just do the same, yet it doesn't always work that way. The flip side of it is I look at this Wallabies team and there's, there's, there's three ball players who can play at 10, who can execute the, uh, Michael Checker's game plan absolutely seamlessly. Now that is a really strong thing. That's a fantastic thing to have. Uh, you look at 2011 World Cup campaign, New Zealand won it with their four string f fly half. You need to have that depth at times. Yep. So the, I think there's both sides of the equation that you could, you could debate on. Putting the selectors hat on for a moment, if you were choosing the positions of 9, of nine 10 and 12, who would you endorse? Oh look, I, I think going into a World Cup, I prefer to, to know exactly what I'm going to get and for that reason, I personally would pick Phipps and Foley. And then I'd probably put uh, Matt Guido at 12. I think the leadership that he provides, uh, the experience that he brings to the table, and he's already proven that he's up, he's up to international standard, no doubt about that at all. And probably even more so, he's played up in the Northern Hemisphere in big game footy. He's won all the trophies that you can almost win up there. Yeah. So I love the fact that he's him and Drew and a few other guys are eligible, but also but probably I think he can make a massive, significant tr contribution. So quite ironic that he hasn't played for so long, yet I think he could well be one of the persons that's, that's, that makes a massive contribution. So for me, 9 and 10, I love those two players in the fact that you know exactly what, you, what you're going to get with them. Uh, Phipsy is the heart and soul. He puts that into every single performance. And Bernard Foley, uh, as a ball player and also a match reader, a, a team caller, I think he's very good at, at executing the game plan. Um, and the great thing about th those two is you have other guys who you know can come on and provide X Factor and, and provide a little bit different skill sets uh, to probably finish off the game. Now, uh, will that ha will that happen? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, even Matt Tamur, I think, may well be a dark horse to get that 10 spot, even though he hasn't played much this year. You've been fortunate to play in a World Cup final, albeit on the other end of the uh, scoreline. What does it take to reach the final stage of the tournament? Well, I think first and foremost, you've got to build through the pool stages to build up your, your, the quality of your play, the confidence in the team, and just your systems and processes and dealing with what becomes an absolute um, pressure cooker for the whole entire group. And when you're in that environment, you need to have that absolute resilience and confidence in the guys around you, in, in the game plan, in the coaches, coaches, the coaching structure. Everything you're doing, you want to have absolute 100% confidence in, in everything. And to do that, you've got to build nicely through those pool matches. Um, and I, I look back to 2003, I felt like we did that. Um, we played Scotland in the quarterfinal, it was a so-so game and then bang, we were ready to go by the semi, and and unfortunately, you know, the final, arguably, um, was just a little bit past us. Uh, we probably we probably put a, a, put out well dumped a lot of fuel on that that semi final. We really put a huge amount into that game, and to repeat that effort in the final, it was it was mind you, it was double overtime. Yeah. You know, so it was a pretty damn good effort. 
Um, whereas 07, totally different. Basically, we had a number of injuries in the pool rounds. Uh, we sort of only really had one tough game that was against Wales. And through injury and also bringing in the other guys in the team, we actually lost momentum, didn't it? Never really had momentum taking into that quarterfinal. And then obviously our set piece was way off too. Just, uh, just finally, Sterling, who, who do you think the teams will be playing in the final? Uh, it's a really difficult one. I mean, seriously, there's, there's about five to six teams that I think can genuinely go to the final. And so it's sort of toss, toss some cards and see where they land up. Yeah, okay. But I, I can't help thinking it would be fantastic to see an Australian-New Zealand final. <laughs> and and, and there's, a, there's a chance that might happen. Yeah. So I really hope that our set piece is on song the Wallabies I'm talking about. And if that is, I've got really a huge amount of confidence that we can go through to the final. Uh, and, it, and if we do, I think we'll hopefully finish first in our pool, which will parve out a nice path way up to the, to, through, the, through the rest of the Sudden Death Games. And if that's the case, um, you never know, it could be an Australian-New Zealand final. But, but, I mean, you look at the teams out there, you've got Ireland, you've got France, and South Africa, no one's spoken about South Africa. Um, you know, they've won it many times. They've got a really seasoned squad. They'll know exactly what it takes to win this World Cup as well. And flying under the radar will probably suit them as well. So yeah, that's the beauty of the World Cup, right? Um, there's always upsets. There's always one team that surprises everyone. Yep. I'm hoping that team is, is the Wallabies. Bill Sterling, enjoy your couple of weeks over watching the rugby. And thanks very much for, uh, for your insights. Cheers. No worries.